Hi there, and welcome to Coffee with Phil, where our goal is to help you live a life of purpose on purpose. Walking with God sounds easy, but how many of you know it never follows the scripture prepared? In this podcast, Phil shares stories from his personal journey in the hopes that his experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly, will help you as you walk with God on your own journey. Grab your coffee and enjoy this practical and personal episode with your podcast host, Phil Strong. Well, hi and welcome to the podcast. Welcome to Coffee with Phil. And uh, here I am again, spending time with you and uh, happy about it. Uh, this is episode 97 of Coffee with Phil. And uh, might not be important to you, but it's important to me that I note that we are racing along uh, toward episode 100, which is the milestone that I set myself this year. And uh, so I suppose I just say that not to be boastful, but to encourage you to set yourself milestones, set yourself challenges, and apply yourself to achieve those. So I had a catch up with a friend this afternoon who's on a bit of a mission, an eight-week program. He's got a weight loss goal, and he was happy to share the goal with me, and he was happy to share his progress. Uh, What's my point? setting ourselves accountable uh, in the milestones and the goals that we're trying to achieve. Um, And so that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting here drinking my glorious coffee, spending time with you, and I get to achieve my goals at the same time. So uh, sometimes your goals can be life-changing and sometimes they just need to be something that spur you on. And so this is something for me. I I feel like I was driving home so I could record this uh, episode and really felt um, the Lord drop into my mind uh, the topic for today, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, and what I like about that is just the partnership, the, uh, the, the idea that God is leading each one of us through uh, a journey. And I wonder where you are in, in your journey. I wonder how you're being led. I wonder if you're even aware that God is leading you and whether you're allowing him to lead you and whether you're choosing to follow what he's doing. Um, Well, that's an interesting conversation, I suppose we could say. Maybe we'll leave that for another day. Who knows? Uh, But what I wanted to do today is I want to dive into episode 97, Coffee with Phil. Episode 97. And the title of today's podcast is Don't Box Me In. Don't Box Me In. And uh, I want to set that up by telling you a story. Before I tell you the story, I want to say to you, it's really important that we all learn to think outside the box. Um, those that know me well, those that work with me, uh, they'll, they'll know that I'm an out-of-the-box thinker, that I, I challenge the status quo, that I ask what if, I push boundaries. Uh, and, and look, don't, don't get me wrong, I don't underestimate the, 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 the strength of that or the blessing that is, uh, but also the challenge that that is and what it brings for those that are around me that don't really like change. Uh, but but I, I want to say this, that it's, I think it's really important that we all learn to think outside the box. And I want to say that whilst some of us are leaders and others are not, we must stop relying on others to expand our thinking. I want to challenge you in that. Um, well, I hope it's a significant challenge that you, you, you think about how could I stop relying on other people and extend myself in this way. And so, so what I want to do is I just want to uh, share a few thoughts with you and uh, tell a couple of stories. But the first story I want to tell you is, is I'm going to recount a story. It's a well-known story. It's um, something I've heard many times. It's not original. I'm telling someone else's story. And what I want to say, uh, I want to tell you a story about construction of a small building tower, an office tower. Uh, let's just say it's eight stories high and it's being built with the frame and the concrete and the construction crew are working really hard. Uh, the floors are in each level, so they've, you know, they've established all the flooring and they're, they're building away. And one day the uh, owner comes to visit the builder and he says to him, uh, where is the elevator shaft? 
And the builder looks at him and says, what do you mean? What We're building you an eight-story building. And the owner says, well, I want an elevator shaft. And the builder says to him, well, look around you, buddy. Um, there are eight floors already constructed. They're made out of concrete. They're reinforced with steel. There's framing in place. How do you think it would be possible for us to create an elevator shaft for you to get to the top of your building? And there's a contest of wills going on because the owner's like, well, I'm paying you for the building I want. And the builder's like, buddy, it's already half built. We can't do this. And over uh, leaning up, up against the wall is the guy, the old guy who's been cleaning the floors. He's been sweeping the dust and picking up the rubbish. And he comes over and says, excuse me, can I make a suggestion? And uh, they look at him like, well, you're the cleaner, but what have you got to say? And the old man carefully and slowly, very respectfully says, the owner of the building wants an elevator. What if you attached the elevator to the outside wall of the building? Thinking outside the box. Look, I know it's a common story. It's one that we've probably heard before, but um, sometimes we're so engrossed in our situation or we've got our process that we follow or we've made an assumption about what other people have taken, uh, assuming that they would read our minds. And, and sometimes the best thing to do is to step outside that or ask someone from the outside to think outside the box. Hence the topic for today, don't box me in. The eight-story building was like a box. It had eight levels. It had four sides and a top. There was no way you could put an elevator inside the box. And so the old man simply says, what if we put the elevator on the outside? And you know what? Now it's incredibly common for us to move through uh, cities and see elevators on the outside of buildings. Some of them retrofitted on old buildings. Some of them designed that way because they look really cool. And you can stand in the elevator uh, and if it's got a glass wall on it, you can watch the city as you rise up the side of the building. So I'm challenging us. I'm challenging me uh, in my in my world, I'm looking at situations uh, needing to think outside the box to find solutions. That's what leaders do. Uh, I'm going to talk about that from a faith context today. Um, but I want to start with you. I've got three or four points here that I just want to use to help me to share stories and, and encourage you on your journey. And I want to say this. Uh, for me, disruption is a clue to look for a fresh way to see life. And I was speaking with a, a, a friend about this this morning. We were recounting what it was like in the COVID season. And, uh, you know, leading a church, you're in lockdown, you're not allowed to meet with people. There's segregation based on vaccination status. There's all sorts of prejudice. There's fear, there's anxiety, there's anger. And uh, most church leaders, were saying things like, when can we go back to the church we used to have? How quickly can we go back to doing what we do? Well, I wasn't asking that question. I was looking at things from a completely different perspective, and I was looking to see what might be revealed in the midst of the disruption. Because I think a disruption is a fantastic opportunity just to simply push pause in life and look and see if God is trying to show us something new. Often, God will take us outside our comfort or our rhythm or our safety in order to help us to see something different. I was studying a passage of scripture recently in the Gospels, and the disciples forgot to take their lunch with them on the boat, and Jesus is like, Guys, seriously, do you not remember the 5,000 people, the men and their families that we fed on the side of a hill? Can you not remember the 4,000 we fed later and how many baskets were left over? You know, the disruption of forgetting lunch, Jesus saying, guys, I'm trying to teach you to think outside the box. And, and what about the, the disruption 
that Jesus causes when he says to the Pharisees, uh, now you must eat my flesh and drink my blood. I am the bread of life, he says. Um, and the, and the, the Jews that were hostile to Jesus, this is, oh, sorry, this is John chapter 6. Uh, it's definitely worth a read. The Jews who were hostile to Jesus were complaining because they're like, he's saying he's the bread and he's saying he's coming from heaven. But do we not know his parents, Joseph, and the mother we know? How can he say this? And, and, and I'm just saying to you, like, in that time, you know, they knew the Torah, they knew the law, they knew the discipline, they had the, the, the Pharisees, they had the Sanhedrin, they had their way of doing life, they had their festivals, they had their feasts, they had their fasts. And Jesus came and he turned it all upside down. And uh, what I see um, in the way that I read the Gospels is a disruption that God caused in order that people might see him in a new way. And if I was living in those days, I would really hope that I wasn't one of the Pharisees or the hostile Jews who would say, well, we've always done church like this. We will always do church like this. But use the disruption to be able to see something different that, uh, that God wanted to do. And I can, I can think of countless stories in the Bible where God caused a disruption that forced his people to see life in a fresh way, to see, perhaps see God in a fresh way. So what I'm saying to you is, um, as, as we often experience disruption, in uh, different moments, that a disruption when something goes different, we don't panic, but we pause and say, man, I wonder if God wants me to see something differently. Which leads me to my second thought that I wanted to share with you. And, and, and the second thought is this, I want to encourage you to start asking better questions. I had a mentor once who taught me that the quality of the question determines the quality of the outcome. And he said to me, you get poor outcomes because you ask poor questions. He said to me, start asking better questions. The better the question, the better the result. Because you're going on a completely different journey. So I, I was talking to someone about this the other day, and I said, what, what if we stopped wondering about what God was taking away, and what if we asked ourselves, what might God add in this journey? It's a different way to look at things, right? What about this? You know, this is a classic that people um, drop into uh, when they're confronted or they're in a crisis or a disruption. People often ask, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why is it always me? Why me? This isn't fair. And, and what if we change that? Because that's a rubbish question. That's a very, very poor question. What if we lifted ourselves and we asked God a question and we said, God, how can I grow through this circumstance? How do you want me to grow? How can you help me grow? How do I respond in a way that helps me to grow? Those are far better questions than sitting, asking why me and winding up in a pity party. And the, the last one that I want to say here is, um, what about instead of asking for answers from other people, start asking questions that lead to solutions? Uh, there are plenty of books out there on what's called possibility thinking. What if? What if this was done? What if that was done? What if we considered a better question? Start being someone. Why don't you learn? Why don't you train yourself to ask better questions, to be someone that asks constructive questions that leads to solutions? Um, I've been really focused in this recent season on collaboration, meaning getting people in a room, asking a question that helps the people in the room to come 
to a solution or an outcome, to go through a process by which together we discover what the outcome is. A, a great example of this, we had prayer meeting last night in the building, and I really wanted us to be praying in agreement with God, what God had promised, and the safest way to do that is to use scripture. So in the room, I said, okay, I'm going to start us off, but I want you to think about what is what is a promise in the scripture that points us to the goodness of God and his providence for his people? And I started with the promise of Abraham, Genesis 12, verses 1 to 3. And God says, I will make you into a great nation and your people will inherit this land. And it's a significant prophecy at the beginning of Abraham's, well, it's not even the beginning of his journey. The point being, at that point, we see an aspect of God that we can learn from. And as uh, sons of Abraham by faith, according to Galatians chapter 3, we can say, God, that was your promise to Abraham. And according to Galatians 3, your promises to Abraham are also part of our inheritance. So what I was suggesting is by asking that question in a room full of people, I can suggest that there is a way that we could find uh, the character of God through the scriptures. And by the end of our time together, no, well, actually, no, that's not true because for the first 30 minutes, we just started brainstorming these things and asking God. And, and I wrote down a list. I'm going to say, I didn't count them, but I'm going to say it was an A4 sheet of paper. There's at least 20, 25 scriptural references that each one of them had significance in revealing the character of God for us. And then we spent the remainder of the prayer meeting praying into those scriptures and agreeing with those scriptures. Uh, now, the point of me telling you that story is it all came from being willing to ask a question that led a conversation into discovering solutions that God's already prepared in the scriptures, which helps me segue to my third point. So. Firstly, I talked to you about disruption, disruption being a clue to look for a fresh way to see life. Secondly, I talked about the necessity for us each learning to ask better questions. And the third thing I want to quote to you is the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 14, where he says, I wish that you would all prophesy. And that's 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5. In that passage, you can read verses 1 to 5, because Paul's basically saying when you come into this place of prophecy, prophecy uh, you, you, you strengthen those that are around you. And so my third thought for you is to say, as the Apostle Paul did, I wish everyone would prophesy. And let me define this for you. Prophecy, in my view, and, and, and um, this is not a teaching session, this is just helping context, it's, it's very simply the ability to see what God sees and come into a place of agreement that establishes God's kingdom here and now. But Jesus himself said, with two or three gather in my name and agree, thus it shall be established. Well, what if you were agreeing with God's word and establishing that truth in your reality? And that's quite simply all I mean by prophesy, coming to a place. And so uh, what I've been doing lately, uh, I've talked to you about my reset. You can go and listen to that episode. It'll be in the list uh, on your favorite podcast channel. Uh, look for the one on reset. Look for the one on seeking new things. Because I put myself in a place, not just where I would prophesy, but where I would submit myself to the ministry of people who are prophetic trusted prophetic voices where I was confident that they had sought the heart of God for me personally and were sharing it as the voice of God, as an expression of the love of God in the, using the gifts that God gave them. Now, what I do with those prophetic words is I then bring them before God humbly in prayer. And I'm saying, thank you, God, for this gift. This gift is showing me what's on your heart for me. And uh, if it's for this season or the season to come, what I'm doing is I'm holding it saying, Lord, you're in charge of the timeline, but I just want you to know I'm willing to agree with this. I'm saying yes and amen to the promises of God, that God's will and purpose and goodness and 
manifest presence would be established in my life. And as I come into that place, I'm, I'm lifting the box away. I'm, I'm no longer boxed into my current scenario. I'm only limited by God's heart for me, which his love is endless and nothing could ever separate me from that love, neither height nor depth, nor the principality nor power. Um, so what I'm saying is the ability to partner with prophecy is a fantastic way to bust down the box, to say, I will not be constrained by my history. I will not be constrained by my circumstance. I will not be constrained by my lack of belief. I'm going to put myself in a place where I align myself with what heaven says about me through trusted gift of prophetic ministry. And I'm going to see potential in that. Now, some people find this a little bit fruity. Some people might find it a little scary. But I want to say to you, quite simply, the key here is to agree with God. And so if you're not quite in a place of comfort where you're willing to trust prophecy or you don't yet have a community that you can depend on for safe prophecy, then what I would say to you is agree with scripture. Go back to exactly the story that I just told you about the prayer meeting last night. Go back and listen to that section again in the podcast and and find the scriptures that you can agree with. Because if you believe in God, then it's safe to say that you, uh, well, no, uh, if you believe in God, you should believe in the Bible. You should believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God that comes to us from God himself through trusted authors. Which means you can count on scripture. So if the Bible says something, it's true according to God. Therefore, with the wisdom and the guidance of God's Holy Spirit, you can say, Lord, give me scripture that helps me to bust down the box and see what you want me to see. I've told this story many times, you know, there was a time where I was asking God, what on earth just happened and what do you want me to learn? I thought one thing and God's like, well, you thought wrong. And I said, what's the story, God? And he gave me a scripture and he says, I took you through this process to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's the beginning of Deuteronomy chapter eight. I think it's verse four. The point is God used scripture to lead me and to teach me to see outside the box that I had been living in. And as a result of that, I learned to trust God in a new way and his word, and it it elevated me into a new space with God for which I am still grateful. So the third point, I wish everyone would prophesy. The final thing I want to share with you, and this is kind of a bit of a warning, I guess, is staying in the box may well mean that you miss out on God's promise. Do not be someone like Saul who hides in the baggage trying to avoid the mantle that God wanted to put on his life to expand his life outside of his paradigm that Saul would be chosen as the first king of Israel according to the prophet and his ministry, and yet he's trying to hide in the baggage away from the ministry that God had for him. So, so, so staying in the box or hiding in the baggage was Saul's way of trying to miss out on God's promise, which actually affected the whole nation of Israel. What about those ones, uh, speaking of the people of God, go back earlier in the story, uh, what about those ones in Numbers 14 that had to die in the desert because they wouldn't believe that God would deliver them into their promise? A whole generation. Read the story. It's Numbers chapter 14. Oh, uh, I read it in my quiet time this morning, just to remind me to not be ones that sees giants and obstacles, but to be one like Caleb, to be one like Joshua, who are among those who spied out the land and spoke these words. The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their 
protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Everyone else wanted to literally kill them. And, and so what I'm saying is, thinking small, thinking based on fear, thinking on what you see, not what you believe, uh, would mean, could mean, may well mean, that you die in the desert and miss out on the promise God has for you. I would also say to you, it's a little bit cheesy, but don't be like Lot's wife and get salty. Now, if you know the story of Lot and his family, they lived in Sodom, uh, which was a treacherous, wretched place that God wanted to destroy. And Abraham interceded for his family that God would deliver them. And an angel or a couple of angels visited them, delivered them. But the story goes that as they escaped fire and sulfur, it's probably some kind of volcanic, massive uh, eruption, but fire fell from the sky to destroy the city. And Lot's wife looked back against the instructions of their angelic messenger, and she turned into a pillar of salt. Now, don't look back. You know, the same story with the people coming out of Egypt, and they, they're facing um, challenges, and they said, well, it would have been better for us if we went back to Egypt. Even in the beginning of Numbers 14, um, they're quoted as saying this. They said it at the Red Sea. They said it when they ran out of water. They said it when they ran out of food. Don't be someone that looks back and gets salty. Come on. Be people that seek God and his promise and be willing to trust his name, his nature, and his character in order that you would walk into the fullness of the promise that God has for you. Don't be like Lot's wife and get salty. Don't look at the past and limit what, what, what God wants to do as he moves you outside of the box. And finally, don't be like the rich young fool who wanted to inherit the kingdom. He asked Jesus, what should I do? And Jesus says, it's great. It's easy. Just sell everything you've got. Give it away to the poor and come follow me. And it says, the man went away disappointed for his wealth was great. He wasn't prepared to see outside the box. He wasn't prepared to put his trust in Jesus and not in his resources. His wealth was great. Therefore, he could not see what God had for him. So he was boxed in and limited by his abundance, which sounds crazy. But, well, look, I'll let you process that, I guess. Hey, uh, what I want to say is um, I don't want to be someone that gets boxed in by circumstances or challenges. Uh, and I don't want you to be someone that gets boxed in. And this is where faith comes real, because we have to live our faith demonstrably, meaning it affects how we live, it affects how we move, it affects the decisions we make. And if God has given you a promise that's greater than your circumstance, then I'm giving you permission to pray this prayer. God, I choose not to live in a small box. I choose to expand my faith to partner with you in the promise of heaven for my family, for my future, for my work, for my city. Don't allow the enemy to box me in, Lord, but lift me out of this box and help me to see what heaven has for me. If you pray that prayer, faith will come upon you. God will take you on a journey and you will no longer live inside a box of constraint. And if that happens to you and it happens to enough of us, then we are going to be God's light shining in the darkness. And that's the, that's the exciting part for me. Anyway, uh, that was an interesting conversation. Uh, Coffee with Phil, episode 97. Don't box me in. I want to say thanks for joining me. And I look forward to joining you again real soon. We go on a journey uh, and we share a few more stories um, because we want to we wanna live a life of purpose on purpose. So God bless you. Have a fantastic day. And I look forward to being with you real, real soon.